my English teacher. <laughs> and so I was visiting my English teacher in his office and I saw a book, you know, and up a, that was called, and it was Nafanua. It's a collection of, of, of writers from Oceania. And I, my immediate thing that came out of my mouth was Pacific Islanders can be writers. Like I had no idea because up till that point, we'd only read Asian writers, you know, because we were in Hawaii and I don't know if you know the situation with Hawaii, but there's, you know, Pacific Islanders don't necessarily have as much I don't know, there's a weird hierarchy there, all that to say. Um, and so I was shocked that Pacific Islanders can be writers. And that's when it dawned on me, hey, maybe I could write. And that was a huge deal for me at like sixth grade to, to figure that out also. So um, yeah, I can totally relate to that. Laura, I read Laura Ingalls Wilder, all of it. And so for that poem, what's really funny is I actually went back and reread it to remember some of the pages and like what, what were some of the things that I, that stood out to me. And that's when I found those different lines. And so it was funny because I remember going to the library with a friend of mine and she was like, what are you doing? I was like, I need to check out all the Laura Ingalls Wilder books for a poem. <laughs> yeah, so I totally, I totally get it, yeah. Thank you. And we've got a question from Gemma. Go ahead, Gemma. <clears throat> uh, thank you, Karina. Thank you for thank you, Kathy. Uh, just like what everybody said, it's been so um, it's such an honor to share space with you tonight. Um, I just wanted to ask, and this is because of a few people have asked me like privately about advice for youth who want to get into the environmental, um, you know, activism space. And I'm so sorry that this is not related to your <laughs> to your writings. Um, it totally so, is. I mean, it totally is. Yeah. No. I mean, if if you're keen, like, is there any advice you could give, especially because I know that there are quite like a lot of the women in this book club are like older and, you know, we've got jobs and career directions, but there's a lot of young, young girls as well who really want, um, like, you know, this is something that they see people like you doing, people like Brianna Fruin doing, and they're just very inspired and they just want to get there. But it's still hard because there's no clear pathways for for brown people. <laughs> for brown, especially brown young brown women to get into this space and you know there's a lot of I think maybe misconceptions about how hard it is or you know you need to know somebody to get there is there any advice you can give you know do a b and c and we'll get there <laughs> okay this is tough this is a tough one and it totally is actually related to my work because I write a lot about um, organizing and and climate change and all that so um uh okay so this is tough because I would say there's a lot of you, it, it depends on where you are. So if you're, um, if you're in the diaspora and I'm assuming a lot of you are in the, in the diaspora, you would need to do some research into what are the existing organizations first. So find out what the existing organizations are first. Um, nine out of 10, a lot of them will be white dominated spaces. So um, picking out the brown dominated spaces definitely go for that first. And then you got, you kind of got to wade into the water and sort of see how that goes first, you know, pick up on the energy and make sure that it's a safe space for you. And, and you know, that, and get to know the people who are in that movement, especially the Brown people and Brown women, especially. Um, then um, if, if the alternative is, if, if, if it's a mostly white dominated space, that's going to be a lot, it's, it's tough. It's tough, but it's doable. You just have to go in with, um, knowing how to establish your own boundaries on what kind of stories you are willing to share and what kind of ways in which you're willing to be a part of that movement. Knowing that you might end up becoming sort of poster child prop, propped up on a regular basis for brown stories of, you know, and brown representation on climate change. So there's good and bad things about that, obviously. There's a bad part of it where you're being a brown, you know, you're, you're a poster child and you're, you know, there's some kind of agency that you might lose. Then there's the other side of it where you get kind of, if you progress further enough, you, you get in a, into a leadership role and you're able to bring in more of your community members to take up and dominate that space a little bit more and dominate with your story. So there's like, that's, that's how I would do it personally. But it's, so it's kind of like, you, you, got, you kind of got to figure it out. And then um, again, if, if it comes to the point where you don't like that space and you don't like what's existing right now, then you kind of got to do what you're doing with this book club. You got to find like-minded people who care about the issue and start off slowly with small meetings. And then um, 
I'm happy to connect you to the, the pages that do regular organizing is uh, 350 Pacific. So I would always recommend them, you know, Brianna Fruin, of course. So if you know them, they'll be regularly posting events or like kind of campaigns that you can just jump on and then submit and, you know, your own photos online through social media, you know, um, as you organize with each other. Um, and so that's a small way to go about it. But I, yeah, I would say first it's about doing your homework and finding out what exists in this, what exists already and um, working your way into that uh, because that way you're not building it from scratch. But like I'm sitting right here right now in our Jojibu Youth Center. And this is an organization that we built from scratch because of the fact that um, there was no organization just for youth and environmentalism. So this is something that we recognized as a need and we, we coordinated it ourselves, but it took years. I mean, I was doing this back in like 2014 and, and we're, we only just opened this youth center this past September. And it really helped that I had kind of this profile that I was able to use to fundraise and then get us the funds to, and through the different organizations to get the youth center up and going. So now it's all about maintaining it. So yeah, I think those are the different things to keep in mind. That's what, my, that's what I would recommend personally. Sunrise Movement might be a good one. I follow them online and they seem pretty good and they seem to, to center a lot of indigenous voices. So I would always say prioritize the indigenous brown spaces dominated by brown indigenous women. Thank you so much, Kathy, for your answer. Um, just if the if just really quickly, um, if nobody else has a question right now, um, if you could share a little bit about like just so that not everybody's like scared about the climate, the activism fatigue that is just part and parcel of the work. Could you share about like some of your really big wins that you've had? I think the biggest win was um, in Paris at the Paris COP twenty one. So Paris. Uh, five years ago in, in Paris, um, our climate ambassador, Tony de Broom from the Marshall Islands, well, he was the minister, I think at the time, minister of environment or minister of foreign affairs. I can't remember which one, but he was, um, he went and negotiated on the behalf of the Marshall Islands and, co and created a huge coalition through different like fronts and through different people and was able to get um, the number 1.5 degrees into the Paris Treaty. Now the importance of 1.5 degrees is, uh, for those who don't know, you have to keep the global temperature at 1.5 for atoll nations, um, you know, like the low-lying atoll, low-lying island nations, but also for frontline communities to be safe. Now, when I got there to the Paris COP21, I remember getting there and someone who was a lot more seasoned to me, than me was like, there's no way they're gonna get 1.5 in there. It's gonna be two degrees and that's it. You know, everyone knows what's already gonna be in the Paris Treaty. Right, so you got that poem. Sorry, I forgot that I wrote about it. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, so like they, so he was able to get that into the treaty. So, and he was the one who was driving, discussing climate change things like way early on. So the thing is, we have a lot of foreign diplomats like him, like um, also uh, the Kiribati, former Kiribati president, Anote Tong, you know, who are, who've been in the movement for years, you know, who are part of, um, and they're also leaders from the Caribbean too, who are doing, thank you. Uh, who are, who've been kind of doing that work, you know, in the background. And so, yeah, that's a huge win. That's a huge one that we still hold on to. And this December is the fifth anniversary of that Paris climate treaty. Um, and, you know, it's been about, I think, two or three years since uh, Tony, Tony passed away. So, you know, I think, and then there's a lot of also other wins. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head. Um, I think uh, the Pacific Climate Warriors, you know, basically created the, the term um, we are not drowning we are we are fighting that that kind of slogan it's echoed around the whole world everyone knows that slogan and it was a group of young pacific islanders who pushed that slogan forward you know and it was such an empowering moment to have this 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 chant that we can consistently do on a regular basis i also think that um trump losing honestly and and biden winning is is actually a very good um, yeah, it's, it's huge for the climate movement, to be completely honest, because, uh, you know, a lot of countries, you know, that's the work that I do now. We, we've been, you know, I was talking to other ambassadors and representatives, you know, um, coordinating different calls, all those kinds of things. And the intel that we were receiving is that all these countries were waiting to see what would happen with the U.S. elections, because that would determine the ambition 
at the Paris at the Paris and climate um, treaty in the part and the and the meeting, and so you know having Biden there is a huge one already. So that's yeah, that's actually a huge win forward because he'll bring the U.S. back into the Paris treaty, whereas before he, the U.S. wasn't there. Yeah, and Kerry too. Yeah, Kerry just, I saw that also today that he's going to be the climate envoy. So, yeah. Kerry was there at the one point at the Paris Treaty signing. He was actually working with Sony de Bruyne. Yeah. So, I hope that those are positive. Yeah. So, I know it's like really exhausting to work on climate change, to be honest. I, I don't know. I, I feel like I think of, I like write about it, I organize about it teach about it, I wear it. It's like, I think about climate change all the damn time. So I totally get why people get worried about the fatigue, but it's a long game. It's not a short game at all. And I think if people want to take a break or don't want to be in the climate movement, that makes perfect sense. We don't, we don't necessarily, you know, I'm, I'm not pushing for people to be forced into it. We shouldn't be forced into it. So, yeah. Thank you, Kathy. I think what's also nice is that if you are feeling fatigue, you can kind of maybe go smaller and just go locally. Like, what is your town doing? What is your city doing? Maybe even just like, what is your kid's school doing to be more aware of the environment or or like your church group or youth group? And then, and then just revitalize yourself because it'll energize them and then you can get back into the game. So yes, any and all questions you have for Kathy. She is a Renaissance woman and multi-talented. So if you have questions about her poetry, about her um, nonprofit organization, or also about her work, um, you can hop right in. Um, but I do have a question while there's a pause. Oh, somebody had their hand up. Alicia, was that you? Please, go ahead. Thank you, Karina. Yakwe, Kathy. Uh, Como, Tata, for all the work that you're doing. I'm a huge fan. Um, and just admire the voice that you give to these issues. Um, I remember the first time I was introduced to you was when you did the, when you read your poem at the UN gathering. Um, and so I've been a huge fan since, but I wanted to know, I want to ask you a question about uh, your poem, Fishbone. It was very haunting. Um, but I, first I want to ask you about, I know that um, you've been in your mom's, you know, your mom's tale, I'm sure, in all of her work. And I'm sure that there will, that there's probably a future already kind of thought for you by the people um, to follow your mom's footsteps. But <laughs> no, <laughs> um, what has been the biggest lesson that you've learned um, watching your mom as a diplomat, especially in these times, and as a woman, as a Pacific Islander woman, um, and, a, and a leader at that, um, what has been the biggest lesson that you've learned, I think, at, at the global stage when it comes to advocating for issues such, such as climate change and also just being uh, Pacifica and woman? Sorry, just a second. Um, okay. My daughter just got dropped off by my mom, actually, ironically. Um, here, <laughs> you can go sit and watch, and then I'll be done, and then we'll okay, just take this piece. Sorry, she just got out of school. My mom actually just picked her up and dropped her off here. So, ooh, that's a tough one. I kind of feel like I'm going to have to write a book about mom. But she said to wait until she dies. So, <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, so I think, uh, mom was really guiding and shaping a lot of everything I've done. I mean, I remember, yeah. Um, I remember when she was the first woman to get her PhD and she's still the only Marshallese with a PhD out here. And then I remember when she did that and I remember asking her why she was doing it and her saying, you know, at the end of the day, it's just a piece of paper, but for a lot of people, they won't listen to me or my ideas unless I have it. So that's what, for her, it was always just a, 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 like a means to an end. And so she did it. Um, and then, which was, you know, already really amazing in and of itself. And then she announced her plans to run. And to be honest, you know, that was when we were out of college already. We weren't expecting, I didn't expect for her to run for senator. She's, but she's done work at every single level. She's done, um, 
she was a teacher first, then she was a, well, she was like a counselor, then a teacher, then a principal, then she founded the, helped establish the College of the Marshall Islands, then she was Secretary of Education. So she really kind of rose up the ranks and, you know, did her time at every level so that she could understand it. And so that was, for me, the biggest lesson she was always kind of conveying to me was the importance of, um, was the fact that we are a privileged family, that we needed to give back, that we need to do something for our communities. And so we established Jyotigum, me and my cousins established Jyotigum, our nonprofit around the time when we came back from college. And, you know, we were, we were partying kind of a lot <laughs> and we weren't, we weren't very useful. Let's just say that we were working and then partying on the weekends and it wasn't, we weren't great. And so she was kind of like, you're, you're not doing anything with your time. You're not giving back. You know, you have all this privilege. You should do something with it. And then that's when we finally sat down and we're like, all right, let's, what should we do? And that's how the idea of Jyotigam really came to be, actually. And so she actually gave us the name, too. Which is basically Youth for a Greener, lush, more lush island, uh, more lush place. But it's like Youth for a Greener Marshall Island, basically. That's how we phrase it. And, um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, I, I think it's also really telling that she was, you know, most Pacific Islander family parents would not support a creative writing degree. But I, but she was, you know, for a while, I think she also still pushed back on me being a writer for a while. It wasn't until she happened to go to a, a like a conference on literature. And I think Albert Went was at that conference possibly, but she came back and she was like, you know, writing is actually like the new thing. Like, you know, it's all about uh, us taking our, our stories back and we need to tell our own stories. And I was like, well, yeah, <laughs> that's what I'm trying to do. So I'm really lucky that she, she got exposed to that kind of perception because, you know, a lot of our parents, they're immigrant parents who won't get exposed to that kind of um, thinking. So she, that's very forward thinking of her to come back and be like, actually, this is useful. You can write. And so she, <laughs> so it got really, I got really lucky in that end. So you know, I was able to study and I know a lot of people were like, people were like, what, were like, what are you, what are you going to do? And then I went to the UN and, and people seemed to be more supportive of it after that. Um, but I think the, so I think for me, it's always been kind of being in service of your community. That's always been a huge lesson for me that I got from her. And then when she, yeah, um, actually, that's really, yeah. And so for her, it's, the, I guess the biggest thing that she's always imparted to me is the tangible, being practical. Like, you know, I can't come to her and theorize about the importance of storytelling, you know, or something like that. Like, I, you know, if I wrote an entire thesis on it, she'd be like, okay, well, what does this do for our community at the end of the day? You know, like, that's what she's always been really clear about. You, you need to have tangible products. It was always about the tangible output. You know, it has to, it has to, be, to be realistic. And so whenever I did poems, I did traveling, she's like, that's great, but what have you been doing for the community? You know, and that's where the Jyotigum work came in. And so now I'm doing like all three, it's like national level work, so grassroots organizing with the youth and training and then arts. And that's all because, you know, she's always kind of been very strict and very, and pushed me really hard to be like, you know, how are you helping your community and, and what are the different ways and look at the intersections of the work that you do. She was really, she was really tough on me about that. So yeah, I think I would say that's probably the biggest lesson. Watching your mom become president is like crazy. Nobody ever expects it to happen. You look at your mom in a completely different way. Like you're like, oh, you're, you're your own human being. Like it's like, you don't exist as just my mother anymore. Like it's very strange. And, um, you know, it was also really interesting to attend climate conferences with her where she was, you know, this person, the, the president, and I was the poet, you know, and a lot of what's funny is a lot of people don't connect that we're related because I have a different last name. And so people will like reach out to her saying, do you know this poet? Um, can you blah, blah, blah. And can you connect us, you know? So what I am really proud of and that I'm, I'm glad I have is I have my own career. I didn't build it off of my mom being president. I, my career was existing before she became president. And, um, and she has her own career. And it's a very, even though we have similar kind of passion, she's also passionate about climate change. We're doing it in very different ways. You know, um, she's definitely doing it through the political realm. Um, and so, and we have different perspectives on different things. But at the end of the day, it, you really can't take away how how 
powerful it is to be up on stage with your mom, you know, doing two different things, but sharing your islands and your, and your passion with, with the world, really. So that's something that, you know, I can't, I can never replicate and that won't be, you can't see everywhere. So it's really cool. Thank you. It's just always been really inspiring because she was the sole woman leader from the Pacific at all of these discussions, you know, like everybody else, they were men. So it's always just really, and she, she seemed to have been the most forceful of all of them even though she was the only woman. So that's been really great to see. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for that, Kathy, and for that question, Elise, and also for your question, Gemma. Just that imagery of imagining you and your mother both being there as just powerful women, speaking your truths reminds me just of the entire essence of your book. It, it starts and ends with the basket weaving of women and um, the movement that women can create for all of us. Yeah, so thank you. Um, I just wanted to check in with the time. We've probably got about 15 or so minutes before we get to your hour. Um, we've probably got time for maybe one, one or two questions if they're short, but um, one or two questions left. And then Kathy, at the very end, we would like to take a group picture with you and our copies of your poems. So if anybody else would like to jump in, please go ahead. Hey, Kathy, I was hoping that you could, we kind of talked about this for a long time in our book club this month. That first page, when you say, my mother once told me, told me girls represent wealth for their families, girls continue the lineage. And so one of the things that we've been just really trying to acknowledge like our privilege as most of us identify as cisgendered women. And, um, and so we were wondering, could you explain how, like your thoughts about girls continue the lineage just because we were trying to leave space, build space for people that do not um, normally, are considered within, you know, girls, female and whatnot. And so, um, especially after coming off of the book, Someone Queer Lives. And so um, one of the things that was brought up during the discussion was that there is more than one way to carry the lineage. And so we started discussing that. And I was wondering, was, like, I would love to know what your thoughts were as you were writing and feel, feeling about that line. No, I really appreciate you bringing that up, actually. To be honest, I haven't thought super critically. I mean, I have thought critically about that, that um, it's always bothered me how that kind of burden has been on, on women to, to, continue the line, to continue the lineage, like that's your only, um, only job as a woman is to be a creator. But I think um, and I, I especially can appreciate, you know, how you're critiquing it side by side with Samoan queer stories, because I actually read that, that collection too. Um, I'm connected to Dan Talal Papua and um, and also, um, uh, what's her name? Um, I'm blanking right now, but I, I have read that. Yeah, yeah, Yuki, Yuki Kihara. We met, we both uh, did an exhibition at the Asia Pacific Triennial in, in uh, Brisbane. And um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I love I love how generous you're being, you know, with your, with opening it up to not just continuing the lineage physically, but also continuing the lineage, you know, through, through chosen family, you know, through the writing that you do. You can continue the lineage through the art that you create. It's not necessarily just physically. And I think that's a really beautiful way to read it. And I would appreciate it if people read it that way, definitely. But I, I also think there's room for critique, you know, in the, in the cis hetero uh, uh, norm, norm, kind of normal, normative, I'm sorry, I don't have the right terminology for it. But I think that there's room for critique of my writing in that sense, because that, you know, uh, Pacific Islands, especially the Pacific 
you know, not necessarily the co communities out in the diaspora, but definitely we know Pacific Island um, structure is very rooted in, the, in that kind of gender binary, the gender role. And I was raised in that too. And I, I wasn't really pushed to think critically about it until recently, you know, that I've started to really kind of think more about the fact that gender is a construct and kind of the ways in which we hold uh, women accountable for so many different things. But I think to me, hearing that was also powerful in a sense, the idea that, you know, there is power in being a creator and there is power in, in us being the ones to continue that lineage. And so, because I'd, been, I'd heard so much about, um, you know, the, 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 the way I was raised with so much perspectives and kind of social con constructs of how weak women are, that to me, hearing that was powerful in and of itself. So that, that's what really it came out of. That's what that, that piece interrogates. Um, and that's what it's calling to. But I think that now that I'm older and, you know, that's a really old collection, to be honest. Like I wrote it back when, being, you know, I published it back. And, and those pieces, some of those pieces are, are really old. Like some of them are written back when I was in my undergrad, you know. But now that I'm looking back and now that I'm older, yeah, I think there's room for growth in there. And that could... I would love to write something that kind of deconstructs that a bit more, actually. So I really appreciate you pointing that out. I think, yeah, I would welcome the critique of that piece for sure. Mind blown, thank you. Okay, we do have time for one more question before we ask Kathy to read one of her poems with us. So it is open to anyone else that would like to ask one. Uh, can I ask a question? Um, hey, Kathy, uh, you mentioned, oh, sorry, let me, um, you mentioned uh, like the hierarchy of issues or like um, the hierarchies in uh, literature that gets taught within Hawaii and I'm wondering um, like that hierarchy definitely exists in Pacific spaces as well um, like just I don't know trying to get people to to join spaces like this or even getting like Polynesians to care about the Marshall Islands um, I'm wondering uh, if you have like stories or um, things that you do to to challenge that whenever you like uh, feel that sort of um, imbalance uh, when you enter spaces? Yeah, I love that. Um, I thank you for asking that. Um, so I know you guys have read the Micronesian airport poem, I forget what it's called right now. And then also I have the Lessons from Hawaii poem, and that's all about kind of the racism against Micronesians in Hawaii. But um, I think that, so that's definitely an issue in Hawaii specifically. So it's Hawaii and also in, in Guam where Micronesians are coming up against this, a lot of racism for who we are to, as a people, but also because of the ways in which the compact is structured and the compact funding is dispersed to Hawaii and Guam. So because of the fact that we have this association with the US, it allows free entry into the US and access to certain benefits, right? But at the end of the day, it ends up being Micronesians and Hawaiians and Chamorros fighting over scraps. Um, because there's not enough funding to support the influx of Micronesians coming into those uh, into those islands. And the only reason why we're coming into those islands is because we don't have enough infrastructure and support here in our islands um, that should have been given to us through the compact, but it wasn't. So all of these like structural differences trickle down into day-to-day -day interactions with other people. And so, you know, I grew up with cousins who were getting spit on for being Micronesian in, um, in Hawaii, you know, and just regular, really disgusting comments and terms and things being said about Micronesians on the public radio by leaders, benef cut, you know, benefits being cut. So that's existing already. But then there's the other side of it where I, I do acknowledge that, you know, we're entering as guests into these islands, you know, um, Chamorro land is already being taken from them by the military. With the Hawaiians, they've lost their sovereignty and continuing to fight for their sovereignty. And they're, they make up the largest population of homeless in their own islands, you know? So it's like, 
walking into these spaces with that kind of delicate knowledge of being like, you know, we're a settler too, but at the same time, we're a disenfranchised settler, like is a really unique space to hold, you know, and to be conscious of. And then of course, there's also, you know, a term that uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Vince Diaz, who's a Chamorro scholar once mentioned called like, um, you know, the poly hegemony, you know, the concept of Polynesians, um, you know, representing the Pacific in almost all spaces. Polynesia equals Pacific Islanders, you know, where, and then Melanesians and Micronesians tend to be invisible in those kinds of conversations. So that's, I've seen that time and time again, even at like regional meetings. And so like clear example of that is right now in the Pacific Island Forum, which is the regional organization for the Pacific, Micronesia was supposed to have a candidate set forward to be the to be the uh, Secretary General for the Pacific Island Forum. I'm sorry, this might get a little technical, and maybe it's boring, but you know that candidate has been turned down, and the rest of the region is saying this isn't a good example of Pacific um, of Pacific solidarity that the Micronesians are doing by threatening to leave the Pacific Island Forum because their candidate is not being recognized. But for me, it's it's like, it's just another example of that kind of hierarchy that exists where Micronesians are getting drowned out in, in a lot of these conversations and in a lot of these spaces. So I remember going to a like panel discussion once and um, it was, I think it was a student led organization of, 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 of Polynesians and the Polynesians um, were speaking and, and I happened to say, have you done some work to reach out to Micronesian students? And so they were like, oh, no, we haven't. And we recognize that we need to do that more. So, And I, I'm also really thankful for my friend, Teresa, Teresa San Antonio, because she got like dragged on Twitter for, you know, for, for trying to recognize this issue and trying to call out other Polynesians for, um, for not recognizing Micronesians in conversations and spaces. She lost a lot of followers for that. And, you know, she... She did that because she recognizes that, you know, Polynesians too do tend to have a, a lot more privilege in those spaces than Micronesians. And that really meant a lot to me. Yeah, Twitter is vicious. Yeah. That really meant a lot to me. And I reached out to her privately just to be like, you know, hey, you know, I, I, I couldn't engage, to be honest, because it was so triggering for me. Um, and it still continues to be. I was on a panel recently where a Native Hawaiian stood up and was like, you know, it's it's so great that you're standing up for climate change. We want to support Micronesians, but how do we call out our Micronesian brothers and sisters for not taking care of the Aina, you know, coming into our Hawaiian island and and trashing and you know polluting the area area. And luckily I had another friend who was there. He was able to call that person out and be like, listen, pollute, everyone is polluting is 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 doing this pollution. It's not just Micronesians, but you know, I was so triggered in that moment that I kind of just shut down and I wasn't able to really engage because I grew up with it so viciously, you know, and so in my face all the time. So it's like part of the reason why I like being back home in the Marshall Islands, you know, is that I'm not fighting to be recognized as my traditions. And so the last thing I want to say is that I definitely I definitely use the term Micronesian very, very consciously. Like when I'm in when I'm in Hawaiian space in Hawaii and I'm in Hawaiian spaces and when I'm in Guam, I very much claim I'm Micronesian. Not because I recognize the regional structures that were created by you know a colonizer, but because it's 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 looked down on, and I want to claim Micronesian proudly. So, um, but you know, I'll, I'll I'll always also say I'm Marshallese because that's the that's who I am specifically. So. Yeah, there's a lot to be said about that, you know, about that kind of racism that exists. And I really appreciate you pointing it out. I think that I'm not exactly sure how to, cause I've tried talking to um, other friends who are Polynesian about this kind of concept of poly hegemony and they're, they just laugh in my face and they're like, that doesn't exist, that's not real. And it's like, actually it is, it really is. So, yeah. <laughs> Uh, thank yeah, thank you for answering. Um, I feel like that's that's always such a hard question to hold as Polynesians because we definitely perpetuate that, and I've been guilty of it growing up in Hawaii. Um, and trying to call out like our own friends is such a um, hard conversation. But like the way that you laid it out about introducing the history and the different perspectives or where each side's coming from, um, that's definitely helpful in like setting grounds for that conversation to start. Thanks for that. 
Yeah, no, it's it's such a difficult thing to do. And, and I definitely also recognize that even as Pacific Islanders in general, we're also just all disenfranchised. We're also all struggling, you know? And so I'm never going to say out there, like, Polynesians are more, uh, you know, are like upper class privilege. It's not, you know, we're, there's a lot of ways in which Polynesian bodies also get targeted really visibly because Polynesian bodies are really visible. You get targeted in ways that maybe Micronesians might not. You know, and so it it depends, right? At the end of the day, so I I at the end of the day I I I go by how a person treats me, you know, and how a person engages in the conversation, and I'm more open to discussing it, you know, one on one or or in small groups. So yeah, and then of course yeah, internalized colonization is such a huge thing. So yeah, but Teresa, is, I'm really grateful for people like you and also Teresa who are open to owning it and who will discuss it with us. So means a lot. Thank you for sharing your experiences with us, Kathy. And thank you for that um, profound question, Maxine. Um, for me personally, I am half Tongan and a quarter Palauan and a quarter European. So a lot of my father's stories I never really heard. And now as an adult and after reading your poems, I can now recognize a lot of the hierarchy that existed at family gatherings um, on my mother's side um, and then also just nuances in language and behavior that were expressed between the different groups that, that I, I had no idea um, were present until just in retrospect reading your poems so thank you for bringing that to our attention I know we are a group that um, likes a good challenge we we challenge our thinking try to um, uplift those around us and unpack different things so that we can uplift and elevate our whole Pacifica community. So I think us just reading your poems to begin with was a beautiful start and then continuing to share your work um, will help us uh, unpack our own privilege and help us um, reach out to others as well. So Kathy, if you um, would please honor us with a poem that um, maybe that has been on your mind or maybe a favorite poem that you have. And then after, <laughs> or, or we can read one with you from, from the I don't book. know which one, to be honest. I, I just don't know which, which piece to read. Uh, do you have, do you, is there a specific one that you guys would want to hear? I can do one or yeah, I don't know exactly. Rena, do you have a favorite one? Hmm, I don't know. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm trying to figure out which one to do. Um, Is it possible to do one that has like some written in Marshallese oh, as yeah. well as some in English? Just because a lot, majority of us come from a Polynesian background. And so uh, it's interesting to see the word, like the language, because a lot of times within the Polynesian language, it's very similar, but I had a hard time from a Tongan background because I was just trying to understand, I was like, how do you pronounce that? And so we were constantly <laughs> asking and she was, luckily we had her because she was constantly helping us understand words. I'd love to hear how you read it and how, um, how the poem sounds within uh, Marshallese, as well as, I mean, you can read English, but you don't have to, but <laughs> it would just be great to hear those two perspectives in one poem. Yeah, I'm trying to figure out which piece does that best. I guess, I'm guessing you guys would, uh, the one with the most Marshallese is probably the spoken Marshallese. Oh, am I on? mute or wait am I oh, you're good oh okay yeah um that it's either that or it's uh what do you call it uh or one of the older pieces because there was all those legend poems so yeah i'm happy to do one with, oh really uh, quick 
Rena's back on. Rena, did you have a favorite poem you would like Kathy? Did you have a favorite poem you would like Kathy to read with us before she leaves? Oh, whichever poem you guys like, anything really. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, yeah, 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 yeah. I have no idea. Well, I'm totally <laughs> like um, blanking on what poem to read. Uh, I guess the one that has uh, Marshallese in it is either the Luadamur piece or the Lektangur, or Dudevadeviju. So yeah, I did some research into like the Marshallese female goddesses or female kind of, uh, you know, songs. And then, um, and then there's also Juan Eto La Vilibin Lomedo. There's also that one, the one from my uh, my great grandfather's, uh, Yes, Great grandfather's piece. Also, you're gonna have, oh. mind, I have a question about that if you guys don't mind. Um, oh. about uh, the names yeah, sure. of my experience growing up because I grew up here in Hawaii, right? And then at some part of my childhood, mm -hmm. I went back and then they would like every single day they would tell these stories and they wouldn't tell the names. Mm -hmm. Then I would be guessing, like, mm -hmm. what are they talking about? So when you came up with these poems and then you were saying these names, what was the people's reactions? Or were you like hesitate? Which which which, which poems? The listen listen room do the know. Like any any of the um any of the any of the poems the legend that you ones? mentioned. Yeah, the legend ones. Oh, so I had to do research for that. I didn't hear that growing up either. So I just wanted to learn more about like the, our female, you know, goddesses and stuff and um, the female legends that, you know, I, I went searching for it, basically. And that's when I found those legends, because um, I think for me, and if you notice, like some of them are written kind of like the Bible, like that's, it's an allusion to the Bible. Um, and that was very specific because um because I kind of, what I was trying to do is I was trying to say it as a, I was trying to rewrite our creation stories to affirm the, you know, the women who uh, birthed our clans uh, the, and also, you know, the women who, who played these, who, who played these legendary roles in our culture. So yeah, I know Nick um, like everyone knows Nick you know, but the weather in my room, were stuff were two twin sisters that I had to look up, and I learned about the weather in my first when I went to our, and when I was in our, yeah, I think so, and when I went to our, they told me that story, and that's when I first heard about the weather in my room. At first, they were just like, she was so beautiful, she just was really beautiful, and I was like, that's it, that's that's kind of it, that's all. Like, like, is there more to her than being beautiful? So yeah, they, so they, they ever, luckily they don't ever say them. their name. They don't ever. Oh, say I their didn't name. know that. Yeah, exactly. So in my yeah, I don't know why they would, they would say, no, like, like they would tell the story and then tell the region, like what island they're from, or from what yeah. like village from, but they don't tell their names. So I was like, is that like a cultural yeah. thing? I don't know. I don't, nobody ever, I mean, I didn't grow up with stories, right? I, these stories at all. So, I mean, I heard like, that story pretty weird. Right, right. That's story. like, yeah, every, you know, everybody knows that story. But only if you're from our So right. that's all why I knew that one. So, or like, yeah. I feel like sometimes if um, certain people could tell the story, like if mm -hmm. it's like a chief, or mm -hmm. like yeah one. yeah yeah no you're right i think some of these stories like, are kind of owned by you right yeah. Yeah. yeah i think that's true mm -hmm. so or that like, might also be another I'm reason why because i don't want someone to get demon possessed and i'm like okay mm. not trying to you know yeah <laughs> So there's another poem that I wrote um, afterwards. It's not published in this collection called um, 
monster. And it was written about the Medinawar. And when I was doing research about the Medinawar, and for those who don't know, Medinawar is a Marshallese woman demon that eats babies, that possesses pregnant women, and they eat babies. And so it's a really like horrific monster and people grow up with it and they're terrified of it out here. I know, I'm so sorry, Rena. I'm like, I'm probably are you freaking you out. But the thing is, I didn't no, grow up with I it. Because I saw the piece, because I saw the piece and I'm like, okay, I am not gonna watch this. I yeah, like, so, I watch it at nighttime. Yeah, no, no, no. It's, so there, the piece is actually, um, I think the only recording I have of it is in actually the Genbaku Dome in Japan. <laughs> Because the piece is a connecting, about connecting the nuclear radiated birth defects with the monster woman demon. And so I was exploring that at the time and also exploring my own, um, my own what is it called? Postpartum depression. So I connected all three. The reason why I connected all three is because the women who experienced the birth defects from the nuclear testing, a lot, I, there was a quote from them saying that they felt like they felt like monsters. You know, they thought that there was something wrong with them because they didn't know that it was from the radiation. And you know, in my experience dealing with postpartum depression, I felt like a monster. And then there was this woman demon who's been upheld as this monster. You know, it, throughout all of our legends as this horrifying monster. And so what I tried to do with this piece was a, it was a very much of a healing process where I'm trying to understand those. These, the, the way it is to be a monster. Like who, who gets called a monster? Why is she a monster, right? But when I was doing research into the Medinawar, I would go around and ask other Marshallese folk about it. And they would be immediately like, why? Why do you need to know about this? Like they were totally creeped out. And so like, even now, no one will say some of these, some of these women demons names because there's legends um, with these women and they actually have the names, but they refuse to say the names. So like, it's still terrifying to a lot of people out here on a regular basis. So I think I get why, you know, why they wouldn't say the name, you know, because they, they want to make sure you don't get possessed by it because that belief is so strong that it's still, you know, it's still here. People still like they, they tell pregnant women out here to never be alone or else you get turned into the Marshall's woman demon and get possessed. So, yeah, I totally get it. Well, okay, sorry, we should probably close out. Um, I gotta go soon, but you guys said the et all of Idugundo on the right? So it's so funny, it's such a different piece. I never read that piece. It's kind of an interesting choice, right? I think that was what you guys said, is that okay? Oh, the poem? Oh, I can also read that one. If you guys wanna do the monster one, I can. Should I do that one? We're just happy with whatever you decide. You go ahead and choose whatever works for you. Okay, I'll do, I guess, well, the monster one, I don't know how much mon the Marshallese it has in that though. That's the only problem. Um, okay, so you guys, I guess I could, yeah. There might be kids flooding in here anytime soon. So um, I guess I could do that one first. And I'll, I'm gonna give you the blog post that writes about this poem. Um, oh, doo -doo. So here's the piece and you can follow along if you scroll down to the bottom of the blog post then, or I could just share my screen so you guys can see it. Yeah. Oh, oh, you disabled attendees screen sharing. Should I sc share a screen or not? Just read it. Yeah, I, I, I just allowed you to do it. So if you want to share it, you can, or if you just want to read it, you're more than welcome to. It might be easier for you to follow along, I guess, if you read it. Okay, I feel like, oh no, all the kids are coming in now. Oh shoot. <laughs> uh, for you guys' this meeting, remember I told you guys, the meeting with Yoshiko about the human rights workshop? They're all coming in now. Oh shoot. Okay, let me just do it. Okay, just tell them not to to keep it down and also that I'm just reading a poem out loud. I'll be done soon. Okay. Okay, so it goes. Just you can just let them in. Just let them know that I'm reading a poem out loud. Sorry. I'm doing a quick reading. No, no, just let them all in. Just go in. It's okay. No, no, it's all right. Oh, okay. So you're not really here for the human rights workshop then with your school. No, that's something else. 
No, that's a, hi. No, that's something else then. Okay, all good. You're fine. No, you're good. Thank you. Sorry. You don't have to whisper. It's fine. <laughs> hi, good to see you. Okay, bye. Okay, that's good. All right. Yeah, you guys, the meeting is still happening at 3.30. I think they're just running late. Okay, so all right, I'll go ahead and start reading. Especially because I think my daughter's getting tired of waiting. Or unless she's asleep. Did she fall asleep? <laughs> she's, she's awake. Okay. Uh, sometimes I wonder if Marshallese women are the chosen ones. I wonder if someone selected us from a stack, drew us out slow, methodical, then issued the order. Give birth to nightmares. Show the world what happens when the sun explodes inside you. How many stories of nuclear war are hidden in our bodies? 574, the number of stillbirths and miscarriages after the bombs of 1900. Before the bombs, 52. Bella Gombridge told the UN she could no longer have children, that she saw her friends give birth to ugly things. Neda gave birth to something resembling the eggs of a sea turtle, and Flora gave birth to something like the intestines. She told this to a committee of men who washed their hands of this sin. These women who bore unholy things created from exploding spits and ugly things. And how these women buried their nightmares beneath a coconut tree, pretended it never happened. Sinister, hideous, monster, more jellyfish than child. And yet they could see the chest inhale, exhale. Could it be human? Nana gave birth to something resembling the eggs of a sea turtle and Flora gave birth to something like the intestines. In our legends lives a monster, Medianwar, women demons, unhinged jaws swallowing canoes, men, babies, whole, shark teeth in the backs of their heads, necks that stretch around an entire island, bloodthirsty, hungry for babies and pregnant women, monsters. My three-year-old likes to hunt for monsters in our closet. We use the light of my cell phone, a blue glow in the dark. We whisper to each other. Did you hear that? Did I hear what? The silence of my dreams is severed by her screaming nightmares and I in the mewling mess turned monster huddled in the corner, wide eyed, wild haired, unable to touch, unable to care, unable to bear the exhaustion, anxiety clawing away at my chest. Am I even human? Postpartum, easier to diagnose after the fact. Two years later, those memories haunt me when I became the bump in the night, when I realized I needed to protect her from me. Did you hear that? Nana gave birth to something resembling the eggs of a sea turtle and Flora gave birth to something like the intestines. In our legends lives a monster, woman demons, unhinged jaws swallowing their own babies, driven mad, turned flesh rotten, blood through their eyes, their teeth, their nose, were the women who gave birth to nightmares considered monsters. Were they driven mad by these unholy things that came from their bodies? Were they sick with the feeling of horror that perhaps there was something wrong with them? My three-year-old sleeps next to me. I have lost my fangs and ugly dreams. I watch her chest inhale, exhale, know that she is real, she is mine. I try to write forgiveness and healing into our story, into myself. In legends lives a woman, turned monster from loneliness turned monster from agony and suns exploding in her chest. She gives birth to a child that is not so much a child, but too much a jellyfish. The child is struggling for breath, struggling in pain. She wants to bring the child peace, bring her home, her first home inside her body. It is an embrace. It is only an embrace. She kneels next to the body and inhales. Yeah, that's the whole piece. So that's one. Yay, okay, we got we were able to do it. I thought well, I thought it was a workshop coming in, so luckily they were. <laughs> um and then so I didn't get to read the other one, but that's actually so I'm actually reading from a doc. I can stop share right here. So the other one, I can read the other one. Um and then we can close out if that's okay with you guys. Yeah, that one's always a really intense piece actually. And especially when I was performing it, it was even more intense because I was embodying the Midian Vlad. 
So the song goes, uh, so, if, uh, so I'm sorry, but I cannot sing for the life of me. <laughs> so you're just gonna have to endure it. <laughs> So it goes, it's a lot you live in the middle. Juma Carl was a marine garden. It's a lot of it, but it's a lot and mantara. A lot of and mantara. A culture of aqua hands pruning giant clams, barnacled mouths, wide open, unblinking eye of the reef watching, always watching. Ijo yar dodas, ye. Once German, once Australian, once a rash and bold current flowing in from the east. Now father of a harsh tongue, a soggy Bible. Father of a used canoe. She must have been beautiful. Bubu Arbello was tall, straight hair to knees, an unclear face, a vacant voice. Ailing Odenje Renana. What else was she? Where her? Where are her wild letters sprouting from sand? After pushing and pushing and pushing, she snapped into tore open. She sprouted wings, and Jinla could not find her. Jera men He lost her. Jinla lost his voice. He wandered for a year searching. He found Bubu Nemi, Ikburong. Bubu Nemi was not as beautiful as her sister. In Tevalangan, he's been Rojari. Short, thick, kinky hair, an unclear face, a vacant voice. Imonagan Ronibu. Was she ever afraid that she was just a shadow? Nayadinaid Rong Ainigian Jina, of what he lost before. Gurdog no you. Jemma was a used Jemma was a used canoe. He heard the call of other atolls searching for God. Bubu was a barnacled mouth, a pair of unblinking eyes, brief eyes waiting. always waiting. Sorry, I was reading from um, my draft of the poem so it's a little bit of a mess when I was reading it out loud but at least then you could hear some of the Marshallese and Rena I apologize for my miss for my mispronunciation <laughs> so yeah that's it yay hey that was beautiful <laughs> thank you yeah, a little bit rougher <laughs> yeah yeah uh, the the first draft over here is kind of a mess, but okay. Thank you, everyone. Thanks for having me. I'll yes. probably get up now. Oh no, you did great, and thank you. It was nice to to see just the the breadth of the type of writing that you have to to feel that really heavy weight in in the monster poem, and then also to read um, the song lyrics. So thank you again for visiting with us, Kat. Yeah, no, it's totally great. Thank you for having me. I'm, it's funny rereading that poem. I haven't read it in for eight ages. That's also why I was stumbling a little bit. I haven't read it in years, but I'm actually seeing a lot of similarities between the two pieces. So it's kind of interesting to see. Thank you for having me. I had a lot of fun. Thank you, everyone. Oh, and I guess we're doing the picture. We'll go ahead and take a photo real quick before you leave. I know everyone's got their screens on now. And Lilika, you're, or whoever can do a backup photo just in case. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Oh. I never know where to go with my book. Okay. There you go. I see some folks getting ready. So I'll wait another second. Okay. I will count us off. One, two, three. Oh, wait, Lilika, I took it right before your, your phone came up. We'll do one more. I'm always... Oh, I'm always so anxious that I won't get one with everyone in it, or my eyes will be closed. Okay, Kathy, we've got one more. One, two, three. Great, I'll send that out to everyone and we'll stay on for a little bit longer to debrief for book club. But thank you again, Kathy. I'm sure you'll be getting a lot of time. Come on, Come on. Come on. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hi everyone. Thank you so much, Karina. That was awesome. You're welcome. <laughs>
it was so hard to like try to be cool and like this is not a big thing i'm not fangirly because she just didn't seem like a person who wants to be like all loved on like that so i was just like trying to read her love language misha see i was trying to read her love language like oh she probably doesn't want like an overbearing person and so i'm gonna be like cool like yeah this we're sitting here with you. That's nothing. <laughs> yeah, I'm over here just like sweating. Like, oh, forgot to turn the fan on. <laughs> oh my goodness, that was wonderful. I, I just wanted to first say, um, thank you, Karina, for putting for facilitating that. Rena, thank you so much for organizing that. Um, for some reason, it didn't connect to me that um, there is that bond that if you are from the same canoe, like Rena would say, um, you just feel more, I don't know how you would say it, like more, more responsibility to show up for your own people who are in the same canoe. And so thank you for utilizing your position in the canoe arena to help her come to this space. Um, I appreciate that. And uh, um, I know everybody here appreciated that too. Um, I wanted to debrief about tonight as well as debrief about whatever you wanted to talk about everybody, but I wanted to leave space for because we all are pretty much in the secret Santa um, group. If you wanna hear about it, you're more than welcome to stay. If you could care less about secret Santa, you can, you don't have to stay, but I wanna leave space for that and let Misha or Gemma say what they need to say on that matter. And then um, we'll close out, but let's go ahead and give space to just processing what just happened, what you felt about the author speaking about the readings that we were covering this month. And then if there were any new things that stood out to you that you didn't quite pull out of the book, but then after her discussing it, that showed up. Well, I'll go first. I think that was totally amazing. And I was like totally fangirling, I, like low-key freaking out, but um, it really did clarify some things about like cultural things, about like the naming and like the, the stories of, so it's good to um, hear perspective, knowing that she grew up here too. So that was that. Thank you everyone for the um, questions and coming in, tuning in. I, I really enjoyed the um, the reading of the monsters piece. Uh, I had read it like a long time ago in a class, but I like, I don't know, for some reason I, it didn't hit as, of course it didn't hit as much until she read it and she was talking about like her own journey of, of like postpartum depression and it, it just made me like think how like grateful I am for stories like that um because I don't know like what are the chances that that's a legend in a place where um like that would be like suffering from all this radiation and miscarriages and um how like she could draw those connections and like turn it into something um that was embracing and something empowering. Uh, I thought like, wow, that's like, even though that that may not be what it's like original um, purpose was, but I mean, that's still like such a, a great thing that like artists can do. Um, and it just me, makes me like so grateful for our own stories. Um, yeah. I think it's just such a special experience to hear somebody read their own work to you and for you to be able to sit and hear their voice, their their intonations, where they pause. And it, it makes you feel it differently than when you read it yourself. So I really appreciate everyone being able to reach out to the authors that you guys have brought in. 
It makes it feel extra special. Like, I mean, we found them in a book, but look, they exist as a real person. And so we can really just be here with them. I, I love it. Can I just um, mention building off of the amazing question that Maxine asked regarding how to get um, Polynesians more involved. And this is something that I myself am guilty of um, as a Samoan, just always assuming that whatever suffering, whatever prejudice Samoans face, that's the level, that's the bar. And you know, there's nothing else below that. Um, I was wondering if we could make it a standing question in all of our book clubs to always ask who else who's lower on the totem pole than you are and what is what are you or what, are your, what is your community doing that like keeps that status quo i like that Gemma. i also feel like that really put into perspective a lot of the things that i've been dealing with on the vision board just trying to create a more inclusive platform that ha that started off with, you know, serving what I only knew at the time, but has since then expanded. But um, I also wanted to say in this process for myself, I don't want to speak for everybody else. When I um, when I think about what who I am and how I identify as a Polynesian. Um, I think about like, oftentimes I just, when I see that hierarchy that is there, that is so blatantly there, I just feel like, you know what, we ain't shit, like, we need to stop acting like we something, I'm like, we are just as strong as the weakest islands in our ocean, and so if they ain't nothing, we are nothing, so um, I just had it, like, the whole time she was talking about it, I was like, yeah, tea up is for nobody if we cannot, and like mate maatonga is for nobody if we are struggling in Micronesia and we can't even claim our brothers and sisters in those spaces, like, um, and there's no healthcare for people in Micronesia that come to Hawaii, like, we're, we're just nothing. And so, um, like, when she gave that part in the discussion, I just wanted to be like, sis, don't be afraid, like, call our asses out. I'm ready. I'm here for it. I'll be like liking it, sharing it. I'm like, yeah, that's right. And, and you know, I just, that's not her burden. Like she shouldn't have to carry that burden. I think that's something that has to come from our Polynesian diaspora where we show um, this form of collective and holistic approach of trying to, um, you know, show representation. And I'm so glad she brought up that meeting, even though she called it boring. I was like, Nah, share us the tea. Who who was there? Who was giving these problems? Like, say names because we we can be in their DMs tonight. <laughs> so, anyways, but um, yeah, Gemma, I just wanted to say that is something that needs to con that's a conversation that we should continuously have. Um, tonight it made me feel bad because in our space we only have Rena, which we've kind of tokenized and only nized her in this space and I feel sorry Rena I hope we haven't put you in a too horrible of a situation but that really is my goal is to continue to push out invitations for um, people within other areas of the ocean to be part of this community but yeah so that's my new thing for now on is constantly telling myself and my peoples in my regions like we ain't shit <laughs> and so anyways that's the model I'm going into in 2021 as well as starting right now <laughs> okay I just want to jump in and share my appreciation for this conversation happening I mean I have Micronesian heritage and so reading that whole oh I'm always crying in the space what is it you guys like just Make me safe. It's safe. On That's camera. why. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but just like reading that and understanding more of my father's demeanor, like he's not necessarily a quiet person. He's got so much to say. He's brilliant and really wise. Um, but the ways that he's maybe talked to people and and shown his power have been in ways that. Um, 
I think that he's learned that don't harm him or bring him harm or, or trigger experiences that he might have had. Like this was, this was heartbreaking to read her story about this. And I think I missed the book club meeting where you guys went over the poems from Lessons from Hawaii. And like, I've, I've never been to Hawaii or to any of the islands. And like my only knowledge is from my parents' stories, but my father never really shares a lot of his. And so there's, um, just a nuance to his experience as well because he's only half Palauan and he's half white. So he has his own stories of, of being the white kid on the island. Um, but I appreciate uh, you ladies for asking that question. And just like, I don't, <laughs> I don't wanna be this token half Pal Pal Palauan kid asking, well, what are we gonna do about all this racism happening in Hawaii? Like, are, we have a large presence of Polynesians. And, and I know even in my life, Polynesia has just taken, my Polynesian culture has just taken up more space. Like I didn't realize that it was just by association of where we went and who we once spent time with that I didn't have a lot of my Micronesian uh, history and heritage being shared more often. And yeah, I'm just, oh, it just makes me feel all the good feels that, that you guys are creating these spaces and asking these hard questions. Cause I'm like, I'm still just this person in the middle. Like, I don't know if I can ask questions on either side, but it's it's encouraging that that we are willing to hold each other accountable and also our families and the people that we interact with to make this space um, a, a true Pacifica space with representation from everybody. Yeah, um, I too just really appreciate the conversation on accountability and exercising accountability, especially knowing, you know, the hierarchy and how, well, I don't know if it's a hierarchy, but just knowing how we are, the Polynesians are the top of the, you know what I'm trying to say. Anyways, but I, I wanted to kind of comment on, I think it was something that Gemma brought up about how we can um, be more involved with the issues that are happening in the Pacific. Also, just because I feel like Micronesia is doing so much in that because they are like, I mean, Pacific in general are affected first, but Micronesia, like Kiribati and like, there's so many, um, I feel like there's such a strong fight and pull in that, um, in Micronesia that I feel like there should be more involvement. And um, I love that Kathy mentioned that there are already existing um, spaces that we should, you know, look into and also like put indigenous brown voices at the forefront of these issues. Um, I also wanted to comment how I loved like, I, I wanted to bring it up, but I didn't wanna, I was just also fangirling and just very like shy, but I wanted to bring up the history poem and how much that brought so much like I, I felt like growing up I did history day in, in high school as well and like it felt like it was just a school competition to me like it felt like this is just a school project but after reading her poem on history on history project like I could see how like especially our discussion about how the judges treated her at age 15, like to me, I felt like the, going back to the, the suggestion about what we can do in our own communities. Like I felt like, cause judges can be, can volunteer on these um, for history day. And I'm like, I, I could totally be a history day judge. <laughs> like I could totally like volunteer and be a judge and choose these projects to win. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's like, I know I'm, I'm, I'm sure there's probably like rules to it, but but just like things like that, you know, like things that I thought growing up were just like insignificant, like they didn't really wouldn't affect the Pacific. But I'm thinking like those are small ways that we could totally be involved in like on a local level to like get these um, like our stories get more awareness around our stories, like just be volunteering for like something like history day and and choosing the project that that aren't like the history that isn't in our textbooks that we don't know about. Anyways, those are just some of my thoughts around that, but just wanna say thank you for those who held space and, and were sharing. I just had so many feels around that. I, 
I also really thank you every thank you so much for creating the space um and thank you Rena and Karina for uh being our voices and representative um I also really appreciate the conversation around representation of who who we belong to and who belongs to us because I think it's at the it's at the very foundational level of how we identify our our people right or our who's who's on our canoe um I used to run a leadership development program for Pacific Islander college students and we used to do this activity where you agree disagree or take a neutral stance and one of our statements um was uh when you say Polynesian you mean Pacific Islanders and so it's not surprising that most people are like, yeah, of course it means Pacific Islander. And so we did a lot of education with our own students about like, no, it's not just Polynesians that make up that label. And if if you say Polynesian, you should mean Polynesian, but you shouldn't assume that it means everybody because you're leaving out two other groups that hold the same weight as the rest of us do when it comes to our identity. Um, and so it was uh, even something, a point that, like a point that small was such a big eye opener for a lot of our young people that went through our program. And so, it, you know, it's just a starting conversation about how do we continue to think about who we bring along with us when we're creating spaces? Um, because even when you think about ca us calling ourselves Pacific Islander and whatever labels we try to like make more inclusive and you know, when you say Oceania, people are like, well, that's like based on an English word, so we shouldn't use that. Or people say like, let's say Moana then, because that's a Pacifica word, but it's like, yeah, but Moana is more still Polynesian and not in the other languages. So that's why I always just revert to Pacific Islander because I'm like, all right, let's, just, I'll just define what I mean when I say this. But um, it's such a fundamental understanding that even using those three labels, right, is problematic, but how are we bringing our people along with us? And so um, I worked really closely with the Marshallese community in Orange County, and they have become part of my family. And I've, it is so hard to learn to say the words properly, um, but it's, it's so heartwarming even for me to learn how to say thank you properly in Marshallese. Um, that it connects me to the people. And so I th I really appreciated the request for uh, reading the poem in the language because, you know, it's I feel like it's easy to read the Polynesian languages or some of the languages that are similar, but some of our Mic Micronesian languages are so, so beautiful and I don't hear it enough. And I want to be able to like embed it into my brain as like, oh, if I hear it somewhere, I'll go, oh, I know exactly what language that is because I should be able to to do that. So thank you for that request and thank you for creating this space where we continue to like embed these things into our brains. Um, that's so necessary. I really appreciate all of you. Thank you, Alisi, um, for everything. But if you ever need like a uh, help out there, um, I know somebody out there and we'll like get someone to help you. With uh sorry, with uh translating. If you ever need help translating, um let me know. It almost seems like Micronesian and I would love to see like the two languages kind of put together put side by side it almost seems like there's some correlation with the Tahitian language as well as Rapa Nui I'm wondering instead of the R's if it's L's like just because of the dialect but don't I'm not a linguistic guys just don't quote me on that okay I just listen to things and I'm like maybe that that could be it but maybe it most definitely isn't when she said uh you have to forgive me for being so off on like my Marshall Lee's I'm like girl you sounded fine to me I was like that was a lot closer than what I was gonna say but um anyways it just reminds me of that 
one time when I had to do like a history project and I did it on Thogon, the teacher was like, okay, we're going to have you stand in front of the class and we're going to have you um, talk to us in Tongan. And I'm like sitting there, I'm like, oh yeah, I can speak Tongan. And I'm like saying the same things, like just saying rubbish, right? And just like pretending I'm saying stuff. And they're like, you are so fluent. You're doing so great. I, I had no idea you had it in you. I'm a fraud like that. I was a fraud like that in fourth grade, just so you know that I was only talking to Falangi people too. The only time I got moated so bad, you guys, was when there was a girl straight from Thonga that moved into the area and she came in and she couldn't figure out how to do her math. And they're like, you know what? Pauline, she speaks Tongan. and go get her to help translate this. And I'm like, why did I pretend to do that? I'm so moated. I hate myself for like doing that to me. But anyways, that's for another time and another day. But I, I have put myself in a position when I was younger that that I really wanted to try to do it. So anyways, yeah. Too bad I'm not as brave right now to speak Tongan like I was back then. Sis, that's the best way to learn. <laughs> You have to, you have to, you have to use it. You have to say it out loud and you have to keep saying it out loud. <laughs> At least you were kind of saying right words. I had like an ex-boyfriend who thought he could speak um, Maori and I swear he like haka a prayer once. Like he was like, oh, I can say the prayer and it like legit was a haka and I was like, mm. So at least you had some of the words and in the right language because homeboy, no. Okay, Pauline, I'm not talking anymore. You're in charge now. <laughs> this is your show. <laughs> you go. Um, it would be so interesting if Fauna feels comfortable doing this to talk about like what it's like to hear about um, Kathy's thoughts in regards to a person in the region how how did you find the way she said that people in Polynesia are represented versus um, people in Micronesia and Melanesia are often underrepresented in comparison do you feel like <clears throat> coming from Tonga that was were you, um, for one thing, I guess there's a few questions. Did you identify just predominantly Tongan and never as somebody who is um, from a colonized region of Polynesia? And then um, do you feel like there is adequate representation and education of people in Melanesia and Micronesia? I guess Gemma and Alisi can speak to this too. Sorry for being so naive, but Fane, if you want to speak on it, and um, Gemma or Alisi as well. Sorry, I was a bit distracted there. Um, what was the question, Fane? Do you feel like when you identify, do you identify first as a Tongan and do you extend that identity into Polynesia? And how are other um, regions of the Pacific represented in Tonga, such as Micronesia and Melanesia? Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I think it depends of like where I'm at. Like 
if I'm just in somewhere in the Pacific, then I'll just identify as Tongan. But if it's um, I'm around white people, then I'm like, nah, I'm like from the Pacific. Um, and in Tonga, it's yeah, they don't really talk much about it. Like, but we definitely hear um, like with our work with um, the Tonga youth, like we definitely have about and try to educate people about the issues in um, West Papua and like I think like it's so it so I'm so grateful for the space to learn about Micronesian stuff so in that way I can be able to um, bring awareness into that as well so but yeah I'm back in Tonga now yay are you still in quarantine You're muted. <gasps> oh. So I'm assuming that's the quarantine life. <laughs> yes, no. Because I want to yep. go to quarantine. <laughs> <laughs> She, she's in a hotel. <laughs> um, I guess I can I can share having like based on my sorry Gemma. Oh. I mean it's it's been so long, right, Pauline? But uh, based on, and I think even here, it, you know, as an immigrant here, growing up here, um, you don't know. Oops. Oh, um. Because I think like the term Pacific Islander is like it's a, it's a construct, right? I didn't. You grow up in Tonga, you're Tongan, um, and I mean like Polynesian was a very small thing. I think you learn about it, but you don't necessarily. I didn't necessarily identify with that term until I came here. Then it became what people were familiar with. So if I said I'm Tongan, they were like, "What's that?" So I had to revert to saying Polynesian and people had heard of that. And so that became, and then later on I learned, oh, Pacific Islander is the name of the group. So then I started using that in like college. Um, but, you know, things are different now. And I think the, where Tonga is now, there's more awareness about like the global community. But I remember learning about where like all the Pacific Islands in, in primary school um, you know, knowing, I at least like knew that I, we had to learn all the islands and all the capitals in primary school. And so it started with all the islands in the Pacific. So I remember learning about like Saipan and uh, um, Marshall Islands, but not anything much beyond that. Um, you were aware, we were aware of it, but it wasn't part of like continuous learning about relationships or any, any or anything like that. But I don't know; it might be different now, because that that was like in the nineteen eighties. <laughs> so um, there's Tonga is definitely more you know global these days. So I'm not sure how that's being taught, but that was my experience way back when. Um. Yeah, I think Alice's experience is very similar to mine. Um, the only difference I would say is, yeah, in, in Samoa, when we're in like year three, year four, you have to learn like the capital cities of like 500 countries. And then you have to learn who who's the prime minister in, in Tonga, uh, who was the, who's the prime minister in Papua New Guinea. And we're like, these are just names on a page to us. We have no idea what this is. Um, but yes, there, I reckon, what same what Alice said you don't really identify as Polynesian you just identify as Samoan or whatever and my only other experience uh, regional experience is through the University of South Pacific which is where I attended uh is where I earned my law degree and yeah the representation is very for for Micronesia especially Micronesia is very very low so I think the overriding factor for that is because most Micronesians go straight to the US or to Hawaii for college, for college university. Whereas um, like Tongans, Samoans, Fijians, we don't have that, that option is not that open to us. So we go mostly to USP. And yeah, I think definitely I, in my class, I maybe had 
five Micronesian friends. Granted, there were also like five Samoan students, but that's just because those were the only scholarships that they were giving out that year. So, you know, uh, but the Fijians, there's like Fijians, Solomon Islanders, and um, Ni Vanuatu, massive cohorts, um, student bodies, loved it. Um, but yeah, also what Kathy was saying in terms of what PIFS has done, um, they've just like, you know, uh, rejected the Micronesian representative like that. It's it's shameful, but not surprising. And I can say like Samoa, Fiji, and Tonga, like we're strong players in that forum. And if you don't get the support of one of them, you're, there's no way you're going to get a representative through. So the shame is... is <laughs> The shame is there. So what um, what Kathy was saying, even though it plays out differently in terms of like the American diaspora, the American Pacific diaspora, it's pretty much the same in regional regionalism in the Pacific. So uh, Samoa, Tonga, Fiji, big players. Um, Fiji's got a lot of money just from their own economy. Samoa gets a lot of aid. Tonga gets a lot of aid. That's where we kind of like pull our weight and we kind of throw it around when when we want things to get done. Um, you know, it's, it's political, but it's also like contrary to what the goal of all of these organizations should be, which is the regionalism, not self-centered. Sorry, maybe I'm getting carried away, but, um, yeah. Does anybody have any ideas of how to, and Rena, please tune in um, or add, does anybody have any ideas of how to be more public, create a more public awareness or more public stance in um, discussing this? I don't know how we would, what we would call it, like, uh, like Lilika said, it's not a hierarchy, but it, but there is some form of rank within, um, you know, within the community. And so now I'm just like, what do we call us after Alisi just explained like the problems of being called Moana because it is not very inclusive to the other two regions. But, and then Oceania being referred to colonized. But oh yeah, privilege. Um, how do you, like how would you suggest to better um, serve, you know, people who are more underrepresented and are more marginalized than Polynesians and, you know, really putting it in there for Melanesians as well as Micronesians, what would be the best thing that you would consider being like a good advocate for these two regions that often get left behind more so than the Polynesian region? I really like this question, Pauline, because I also often think of this. Um, and I really like how Kathy brought up how Teresa stood up for her like just her sharing that experience in a in a time that she was so like triggered and she couldn't speak up for herself and the fact that Teresa kind of stepped in and kind of called her own out like called her own friends called her own you know group in um, and I see Teresa do that a lot on on her platform and on Twitter and I, I don't recommend going getting a Twitter, but I feel like we all kind of have social media platforms. And when I when I feel like there needs to be like representation, more representation somewhere else, I'm always thinking of like calling out or recognizing my own privilege. Therefore, like those in my own circles and groups like my call in is more for them rather than, yeah. But anyways, I, I guess I just wanted to say that I really appreciated that Kathy shared that, um, which kind of helps, I guess, in a way to, to navigate um, for me personally, is to 